Are we good? We have 33. That's a good number. Yes, there are some people that are still joining, but I guess that we can start. Oh, yeah. Okay, now well, let's let them go on. All right. Well, it's great to see friends, old friends and new friends. And it's, it's great that the Ecosystem Restoration Camps movement is growing. Lovely to see Kath, who's been beavering away, getting more and more people to learn about the movement. And Inga, who's dedicated. And Marsha, my goodness, it's been a long time. And, and sh she met her partner in the Garden of Aden's. <laughs> what a... In, in Friesland, Friesland is very interesting. Just a short vignette. I had the opportunity to ride around um, one of the, the castles with the queen, Beatrix, before she, she, uh, she abdicated to Willem Alexander. And we rode in, in these ridiculous carriages with those Frisian horses. They were so beautiful. The horses were stunning. But uh, it was kind of odd because we were riding around in these carriages, which looked like, I don't know, something out of a fairy tale. And um, all the people walking in the park there uh, in, near Appledorn were like looking at us and I'm, I'm in the back waving. I'm sure they were like, what the hell is that? What's he doing? In the in the carriage, he must be a was, king. That's what they thought. <laughs> it, no, it was really silly. Um, and I, well, it's recorded, so I'm not going to mention the other bit about the Argentine wine, but never mind. <laughs> um, so already, Argentine wine was a big thing in the Netherlands back then. So, <clears throat> okay, I think um, I did want to just say a few words. Primarily, I've been, I, I am now in uh, Irvine, California, and my classic 2007 Subaru with 207, no, 225,000 miles on it is um, getting some service, but I'll be going back to Mendocino. Uh, soon. And I wanted to um, just tell you a little bit about what's, uh, what's been happening up there. So we've been, <clears throat> there's a camp there, which is called The Land, if you want to check out The Land. And um, I don't think their page is ready yet. They've been a little delayed. Um, but um, there's been a lot of work going on. Um, Alex, hi Alex. <laughs> RSA 09, oh, yes. Well, anyway, um, so the, the land is very interesting because it, it has the headwaters of the Navarro River on it. And this is a 160 acre property that was owned by, I think it's, the guy's name was Jeff Skoll, Skoll Foundation. And I guess one of those, I'm not even sure which billionaire <clears throat> online thing he ran, but anyway, something. So he decided that when the world collapses, he needed a place to go. So he bought this 160 acre Jewish summer camp and um, he never went there. I think he went there once or twice. And so after a few years, he said, well, that's enough of that. You know, maybe the world isn't ready to go away. So he sold it. And it was purchased. And it was, it was uh, purchased by a group that made it into a retreat uh, center where people would go to have retreats in nature and there are redwood trees and wild deer and wild turkeys and they every hawks eagles 
it's a wonderful place. And um, it was really funny because um, all the intentional community was there. Basically, they all knew each other from their work, but they thought they wanted to go out to the countryside, but they didn't know anything about, about agriculture or ecology. And they went out there and they had to learn about it. And then the COVID hit. So it was really quite interesting because when COVID hit, not so many people were able to go or nobody was able to go. There were lockdowns and no one could go to retreat centers. So they, they kind of met together and they said, well, what should we do? And then they found the ecosystem restoration camps and they had been learning. And, and they also had in that period, the same period were fires. And so they started to talk to the conservation district and to the land trust in the, in the area and the different agencies involved with fire. And they got involved with restoring their own landscape. And then they realized, well, that's not enough. You have to go larger. And they learned about the ecosystem restoration camps. And they asked me to come and stay there. And I've been staying there for a bit. And uh, I want to show you um, the latest thing that they've been doing now. And there's more to tell, but uh, I know we really want to get to Marcia because uh, she has something fascinating to show. So I'm just going to show you this very short clip here. Now this is, um, this is, oh wait, I'm going to, I'm going to unshare and, and do the right thing because I was told to make sure the sound could be shared. So now it's being shared. And that's not mine, is it? No. Okay. Surely not. Is that, can you see? Yep. We can. Okay. Here we go. I think what's interesting here is that we have multiple systems which are uh, impacted. So the, the social systems and the and the emotional and spiritual life of the of the inmates and potentially also the guards and then you have the landscape and so in a way what we're seeing is that the human consciousness is is affecting the landscape so if this turns into a flourishing beautiful place then i think we're going to see that same occurrence with the spiritual and emotional and physical health of the of the prisoners that would be wonderful. Yeah, and so the way that we're gonna do that is by creating a botanical sanctuary here. And um, also what we would refer to as an ecosystem restoration project. So we're gonna spend a little bit of time observing what's here and then think about what we can bring here as part of this botanical sanctuary that will become a hub for creating and propagating some of the most important trees that can then go out into the community and start to rehabilitate landscapes in the surrounding community here in Mendocino County. Not only can you do this important work for the society, but the people who study this are going to have something that is useful for the rest of their lives and that that the society and the civilization absolutely need. Well, and here's the other thing. You can go to the store and you can buy something. But that something can be taken away, it can be lost, it can be broken. Education can never be stolen from you. And I think that one of the things that these guys oftentimes are lacking in is hope and education. You know, for me, it's personal. I, I care about our town, I care about the the community here, I want it to be safer. And I believe that the way to make our community safer is through restorative justice in jails rather than punitive justice or retributive justice. Well, I mean, it's been a fun experience. You know, I like coming out here. I like coming out here tending to the, the bees and the, the chickens. Makes you feel a little bit more free, and um, I want 
to say, um, I don't feel like an inmate. The second component of the restorative model that is essential is skill building. People need to learn new ways to earn a living when they're in jail, in my opinion, that are you know, lucrative and essential to our community. So the restorative model needs to have skill building programs, whether that be you know, a metal fabricator program or construction. I was in the field doing and documenting the restoration of this vast area in China and then later all over the world. And what I found as I progressed was that there are principles which are the same everywhere. We depend on evolutionary succession. We can come up with the shared intention to do it together. And that's really where the community fits and that's where these people then become essential part of the community because nobody has as much time to or or focus and this will change their perspective change their lives i know that when i started to study ecology it changed my life and i think it could work for many 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 other people to start studying this observation is necessary to understand it. You, you have to look at the situation and do what, you have to read the landscape and, and understand what na nature would do. It's the ideal outcome. But I mean, I do want to get the water to come back. You know I mean? So I mean, if, if what you're saying is, you know, what, what, what you're saying happened and, and how it did work all together, I mean, I wouldn't mind doing it over this way because we need it. Wow, John, this is really impressive. This is this is a, a topic on its own. Wow, wonderful. Well, I just I'd I'd show you uh, this this the the camp at the land is also working to restore the Navarro River from the headwaters, which meets at the property, and then goes to the ocean. And so this is I think the scale that we could start to consider. Because actually in my research, I would say anything smaller than a watershed is not a real ecosystem because, you know, if you're in a, if you're in a, a system and you can see the edges, then that's an ecosystem. So really river basins are kind of like the right scale for us. So engaging everybody in the community together to get to know everybody and the agencies, the powers that think they have control over everything and the people who are completely separated from the environment. We, we all need to, to come together and learn together. And the, the main thing I've been focusing on now is uh, an idea of central kitchens creator spaces and cultural stages. Because if we, if we put together the basics for infrastructure, and there's one more thing next time, perhaps I'll go deeper into the eco oasis concept, because I think I'm starting to see that there is a, a magic door, which is like the, the connection between human infrastructure and ecological succession. So if we open that door and we go in there, then we start to see the hydrological cycle, the soil fertility and the biodiversity. And we see how they interact together and we can control using the eco oasis, we can control the environment. And if we do this, we actually have a lot of control over the relative humidity, the temperature and uh, the amount of biodiversity and things like the um, botanical sanctuary concept should also be, be thought about and maybe integrated into all the camps. Because if you have seed banks and you have, you have the ability to 
propagate and plant out the, the most endangered species. That makes each of the camps that does this the most important place in their region. So gathering the, the, the genome, teaching people about it, seed saving, seed trading, but also propagation, understanding all these things, bring in all the experts. There's so many older people who have so much knowledge and they're kind of separated from the younger people and the younger people are looking for this knowledge. So by creating central kitchens, creator spaces and, and um, cultural stages, you have a place where you can introduce everyone to everyone and then you can work on water, soil and biodiversity. But now we are going to the Netherlands, which is rich in many things. And it's, uh, it has grown, obviously, and it's affected human civilization. It's brought us such tragic things as, uh, as mercantilism and insurance and the global trade. And it's participated in the expansion of European thought around the world. But actually, I find the people in the Netherlands quite reflective of their past and of the future. So it's a, it's a progressive and important place that's becoming a, uh, an incubator for thought for how, how we can address many of our serious problems. And um, Marsha is in Friesland, which is a very special place also in uh, in the netherlands so thank you and i'll turn it over to inga for the thing and i'm gonna stay here with you if there's anything i can do later so thanks for listening to me thank you john thank you so much for your words and your inspirational story it's um yeah every time something for us to learn from so thank you um i will i will share my screen with you um to share the presentation. I hope you were able to see it. I hope you can. Yes, I guess everyone is. Uh, yeah. If not, let me know. Okay, thank you. So welcome again to already this six fireside chat session. Um, although we're in the session already for 20 minutes. Uh, but as you know, this session will be um, well with Marcia and John, of course. Um, I just want to go over some house rules real quickly um, because I want to make it a little interactive session during the Q&A part. So if you do have a question, please raise your hand. There is this um, button in Zoom uh, that's called, uh, what is it? Um, reactions. And if you click on there, uh, you can see the option to raise your hand so that you can ask your question in person to Marcia. And this session will last for one hour, but maybe a little bit longer, but we leave the room open for a longer discussion. And now I would love to go uh, to give you some news about um, camp experiences and courses that are available for you. Um, if you are interested in one of these camp experiences or courses, you can go to our website, ecosystemrestorationcamps.org, and we have a page called Courses and Events, or it's Events and Courses, it's Courses and Events, yes. And you can uh, find more about these experiences there. Uh, but to quickly go over them, uh, there is a volunteering opportunity in uh, Camp Human Nature in Uganda. And you can go there between the 21st of June and the 30th of July. But we recommend to please get in touch with Ronald, the camp manager, to find a, a date that suits you both. Um, then we have a camp experience coming up at Camp Earth Connection in Mexico, uh, Yucatan. And these are weekend experiences. The first is coming up this weekend. Uh, so maybe it's too soon for some of you, but the other one is from the 25th till until the 26th of June. So this might be interesting for you. And then another camp in Mexico, Camp Via Organica, um, is giving a course for you on learning regenerative farming techniques and gaining hands-on experience. And this is from the 
4th of July until the 9th of July. And then Camp Coyote in uh, California, USA, is hosting a summer camp from August the 12th until the 14th. And uh, Camp Altaplano in Spain um, is hosting another regenerative culture course, which has been successful for, I think, already th three times. So they are opening another opportunity for you from the 9th until the 16th of September. So uh, if you're interested, please go to our events and courses page on our website. And then some camp news um, from the camps all over the world. Uh, we are excited to share that we are welcoming two new camps, um, Camp Pachamama in uh, South Africa and Camp Naguge Hills Lodge from Kenya. Uh, Camp Pachamama is uh, focusing on um, rehabilitating the land and agroforestry, and their vision is to restore inner and outer landscapes. And we hope camp experiences or opportunities to help them will come up soon. And the Camp Naguche Hills Lodge is uh, working on rehabilitating the land um, by agroforestry as well. And uh, they are now focusing on two hectares, but will uh, hope to restore more communal land soon. Um, so we are really excited that they are part of the movement. And then Camp Siotha Cree from Ireland visited the Netherlands to go to regeneration projects in the Netherlands and to gain learnings from them and bring them back home to Ireland to inspire Irish farmers on how to get their regenerative grown produce to the market. And this knowledge exchange is all possible by the Erasmus Plus grant that uh, we received together with the Ciota Cree. And a fun fact is that they visited a um, food forest in the Netherlands. And because they have been so successful, uh, the government changed their policy and they're now giving subsidies to food forests. So this is a very positive news. And then Camp Regenesis in the Philippines, they hosted a training to educate young, um, yeah, local youth on permaculture uh, together with a UN Women Federation for World Peace. And it was the untrained trainer um, principle. So the youth, brought all this knowledge back home to their local communities and they can teach them on how to do permaculture so we i really like this comp concept of train the trainer then unfortunately some bad news from camp doku in malaysia they have been robbed of the construction materials needed to create infrastructure infrastructure to host the campers and to offer on-site training um, so this is really unfortunate and we are doing our best to um, find ways to, to support the Camp Doku with this loss. Um, and then another note, um, the fireside chat sessions will be having a summer break. So the next one will be again in September. But we are hosting an ERC symposium about the role of non-native species in ecosystem restoration. And there isn't a date yet, but we do have two speakers that are excited to be part of it. So um, keep this uh, space uh, open to see it. All right, and now we're going over to Camping's Garden and John already mentioned something about Marcia. So I don't uh, want to tell you. To, yeah, I, I think we can just go over to Marcia if that's OK. Marcia, are you ready to um, share your presentation with everyone? Yes, yes, I will do the screen sharing and um, then, oh yeah, shares, I have to click on share sound. Yeah, perfect. Then it should work. Thank you. Uh, participants. Uh -huh. Oh, I'm doing something wrong. <laughs> I just have to go back to the beginning you might want to make it full screen if you can yeah first i have to um go back to the beginning of the presentation 
Um, yeah, this is the beginning of my presentation. Is it? Uh, is, does everybody see it? Uh, we do not see the the full size yet, but maybe. No. Um, I do have it on full screen. Okay, maybe it's just me. No, it's not full screen. Okay, it's it's not in the PowerPoint as. Um, Marcia, you yeah. need to uh, slideshow. Yeah, you need to start the slideshow first and then share your screen. Then you can go to the because you only shared the PowerPoint, but not the share, not the presentation. Two All right, things. I'll do stop share and I'll try it again. Yeah, no worries. Inga also has it, so that's true. Uh, but let's try again. Screen share sound. How is this? Better. Much better. Yeah. Yes. yes. Bravo. Okay. <laughs> well, then, then, um, then I will start. So yeah, my name is uh, Marcia, um, and I'm an entrepreneur, and I'm working um, for an association um, that's called Caning. Um, and Caning is a citizens' an initiative for a living landscape. And Caning is Frisian because in the north of the Netherlands, um, we actually have another language uh, apart from Dutch and it's called Frisian and Caning translates to King which is short for King of the Meadows um, but who is this who is this King that our association uh, uh, carries the name of that's um, this King the Godwit black-tailed Godwit it's it's a bird um, in Dutch it's called Grutto uh, and in the Frisian language, it's, it's called Skries, um, but we also refer to it as the King of the Meadows. Um, it's a beautiful bird, it makes a beautiful sound, and it's a migratory bird, so it visits our country each year uh, in the spring and in the summer, and in the winter time, it goes to the south, uh, all the way to uh, Africa. So it's also a bird that actually it's one of those birds that actually connects us with, with other countries as well. And um, the citizen initiative. Uh, um, so before I will tell you about our ecosystem restoration camp, I want to tell you a little bit more about um, yeah, the association be behind our camp and why did we start it and, and what are the other things that, that we are doing because the camp for us is a part of of all our activities. So I wanted to bring you along on a little journey to tell you about why we are there. Um, our association was started in, in 2012. Uh, it was started in Leeuwarden, um, which is in, in Friesland, uh, the, you could say the capital of, of Friesland. And it was started by a group of people from different disciplines, um, but they all had the same worry. They were worried about the future of the landscape that, that they were living in. And here are a few of the people that, that started this, this movement. Um, you can see a, there's a poet, a musician, uh, there was a farmer, um, the director, the, the director at the time of um, the Worldwide Fund for Nature, and the professor of ecology, Teunus. And they all found each other in that in that worry, and yeah, what what was the worry? What was the challenge? Um, well, the reason we we chose this this bird, the king of the meadows, is because this bird tells us something about our Dutch landscape. And um, the Dutch land, landscape is definitely not only meadowland. Uh, we have a lot of variety in different landscapes, but meadows are Grassland meadows are um, a large part of, of our country. Um, there's some, some data here. If you look at the total land of the Netherlands, 30% of that land is, is grassland. And if you look at the total land use of agriculture, 54% um, of the agricultural land use is grassland. And in Friesland, where, where we are based, 
it's even more. So 60% of the total land of Friesland is grassland. And if you look at it from an agricultural perspective, 80% is, um, is grassland. And here, this is of course a very simplistic um, image, but here you can see um, the different ways of, of using land. On the left side, there's a natural situation. And on the right side, there's a situation of intensive farming of, of monoculture. But there's also another way, another possibility of using land and that's nature inclusive farming. And it's actually, uh, that's actually very interesting because um, uh, there used to be a time in the Netherlands, I mean, of course, first our country was, was completely nature and then the humans became involved and they started to change things in the landscape. Uh, they started to grow food and slowly it turned into a cultural landscape. But there was a time when actually um, the hands of, of us as humans and the natural processes that we were working with, there was a, a good balance uh, between those two. And that's a balance that we can find back in nature inclusive farming. But we've gone way too far, as we as we all know. Um, uh, we are trying to uh, exclude the natural processes, and the more we are doing that, um, yeah, the more biodiversity we are losing. And I just wanted to show you. This is a picture of of a situation where meadowlands are nature inclusive, and the best way to show you how it is to be there is to just take you there. Um, but since that is not possible today, I, I recorded some sounds of what it can sound like, and I hope you can hear it. But let's just try for a little while. We can, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Well, as you can hear, it's really a pleasure to be there. There's a, there's a lot of sounds there. Um, it's, it's really full of life. Um, and um, yeah, also the smells, it's, it's, it's a beautiful place uh, to be. And we used to have a lot of these kind of meadows in the Netherlands, but they are, yeah, they have uh, really, really uh, dec decreased. So that was the worry uh, of, of the people that started this, this association. And here, I think this, this image also tells a lot. If we are changing our landscape and if we, are, uh, if we continue to ex exclude all these natural processes, then we will also lose all the biodiversity that, that belongs to it. And the Netherlands is actually, when we look at it on a worldwide scale, scale I mean, a lot of people, they visit the Netherlands and they cycle around here and they say, oh, it's so green here. <laughs> but actually, that's the problem um, because we need a lot more colors than one color of green. We need, we need all these herbs in, in the meadows and, and we need the differences in, in landscapes. Um, and yeah, we are, we are not, and on a worldwide level, we are not doing well. We only have 15% left of our uh, original biodiversity. And we all know this report, I think, the alarming report of the IPBES, um, which basically says that we as humans are doing this. Um, so that's why this group of people thought, okay, then, then we have to do something about it. And we, we start in our own uh, environment. Because these people were all from different disciplines, um, they actually found out that that was a strength because there were people from looking at it more from a scientific point of view. There were people looking at it from a more cultural point of view and there were people that were more the innovators. And we actually found out that if we would combine all these point of views and, and, and the different uh, knowledge, um, then actually, if you turn on one of the wheels, the other wheels also start moving. So we, we, the effect that we had when we were cooperating was actually stronger than when we were doing it all by ourselves. And I just want to show you a, a few examples of, of things that came out of, of, uh, of this movement. 
Um, well, the scientific uh, part of it, this is uh, Teunus Piersma, he's a professor of ecology and he's leading uh, a scientific project in the southwest of Friesland. They are studying about 10,000 hectares, um, 3,000 fields. They are involved with 200 farmers and they are studying about 1,000 pairs of, of god godwits. And actually, the main question that they are asking themselves is what do godwits tell us about the health of the health of our landscape? Because it's really, it's not about protecting, it's not only about protecting this, this species, it's about the health of our landscape in, in general. And, and this bird is, is a storyteller. Um, and one of the things that they've learned is that if we look at herb bridge grasslands, um, the chick survival, so the small godwits, is three times higher than in the ryegrass monocultures, which you see on the left. Um, and there are several reasons for it, but uh, the important reason, one of the most important reasons is the availability of food. These, these chicks, they, uh, they are dependent on insects. And when they are born, they immediately have to look for their food on their own. Their parents are there to, to guide them, but they have to do it. And they are completely dependent on insects. And if you look at the monoculture landscape, there are no herbs that have flowers and um, insects, they, they are attracted by the flowers. So on the left side, they, they won't find enough food to, to grow. Another problem is, um, that when the grass is, is, is mo mown or mowed, I, I don't know the exact English word, but I hope you understand me. Um, they also lose uh, shelter against predators. So they are much more visible for predators uh, and they will also much sooner be eaten by, by the predators. And of course, if we are mowing at a time that these little chicks cannot fly yet, uh, they will get into the mowing machine and they will be killed in that way. So for these chicks to survive in a really intensively used landscape, it's practically impossible. And that's why the codwit population is, is, is decreasing uh, so much. So we, um, in order to, to keep the godwits in our landscape, we need to uh, make that transition uh, to herbridge meadows. And this is an, also another really good illustration, I think. It's uh, made by the researcher you see on the right, Jeroen Onrust, and he's studying um, earthworms. And on the left side, you see a situation of a dairy farm that is uh, dependent on uh, artificial fertilizer and on pesticides. And on the right side, you see a dairy farm that's working with ecosystems, so working with, with nature and you, you can see um, the difference in, in biodiversity and also the difference in stability because on the left side, if one thing fails, it's, it's, it's a very fragile uh, system while on the right side, it's, it's much stronger. Um, well, for the cultural part, um, it's one thing to know what's going on and it's very important to know what's going on but what we have learned is that it's also very important to feel what's going on. So that's why we have this cultural aspect of our work as well. And we made, one of the things we made together with uh, a theater maker is a, was a play and it was about uh, a, a farm family. It's based on a true uh, story that lost, unfortunately lost their son uh, in um, a farm accident. And close to the place where, or exactly at the place where they lost their son the year after there was a godwit that started to breed there. And the, um, the farmer at that moment decided to completely change his way of farming and he really wanted to protect these godwits. But his wife saw the financial consequences of, of, of doing that. She, she said, well, I, I understand that you want to do this, but how can we make uh, our, our farm financially viable if we if we make this step and um, so it was something that a lot of farmers and a lot of people could relate to and, and we could really feel what is going on that it's uh, that that yeah that it could be um, 
scary to make make that step because can you still earn a living if 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 you do that um also we had uh in in the museum we had um an exposition where children could look at the world from the perspective of of a godwit and we made this film um a while ago and i wanted to show you a little bit and you can show it you can watch it uh, later uh completely um uh, let me see let me know if you can hear this you can thank you okay. the grond the groom the soil the sun in the grond onder onze voeten speelt zich een magisch spel af dat we niet kunnen zien De grond waarop we met elkaar leven en ons voedsel produceren, is meer dan een bak met sediment. Het is een prachtig organisme. Vijfennegentig procent van ons voedsel komt uit en van de bodem. De bodem speelt dus een centrale rol en is tegelijkertijd zwaar de pineut. Maar de bodem die er nog is, die kan weer bruisen van leven. Door te beginnen bij het begin. De grond waarop mijn voorouders al boerden, hoop ik in goede staat af te leveren aan de volgende generatie. Een fundament voor een goed bestaan. Want al weten we wat van screezen en van reedkapwerms, we weten zo'n soort net. Op uw spleets in Zondel had ze ook even durven. Het nam wat tijd om de baaien met te vertrouwen. En we leren nog, elke dag. Mijn collega behoren, mijn buurlui, elke dag. Leer die zin met te brukken en vertrouw net alleen nog op machines en externe middelen. Wij zijn al vers begonnen. Kenst mij nog? Ken je me nog? Do you still know me? Wetter lijkt me del. Verdronk me en lijkt me verbleerd. Mijn nekende reg stuts hier en daar poppende wegen uit. En elders sleept de zee kronkelende dieptes in het labyrint van mijn lichaam. spul tussen mij en het wetter, which for me had passed in the blink of an eye. Hoe oud ik ook ben, ever again I'm ready to be young. Dartelveulen. Een spring in de wei. Een vereerlen frommes dat alles jouwt, onwaard van haar hart. With my long arms and round hips, I invited you for a salty embrace.
een zwierte tuut. Do genoot is het van me. Quoz is het me. I will stop it here. It will, it will uh, go on for a little while. Um, but uh, I think Inge can send the, the link or maybe the link can be shared in the chat so that you can um, look at it later. <laughs> I, I will do that, Marcia. Okay, thank you. Um, let's go on. And another example of, of how we are using culture is that uh, this year we um, uh, have started a, a new ritual. We are working together with a lot of organizations in Friesland and um, we uh, made a promise uh, to nature. Actually, three humans made a promise to three species, which was a symbol for a new connection between humans and the rest of nature. And they spoke out that promise, uh, and the promise was was brought to um, a place in in um, in Friesland, where it is uh, uh, where you can see it for for hundred hundred days. And we want to do this each year to to renew our our promises. Um, and the innovation uh, branch, uh, we started uh, a living lab. Uh, for nature inclusive farming where which is most mostly knowledge based so it it makes sure that that the um, the knowledge that is necessary to uh, to make a transition to nature inclusive farmers gets to the gets to the farmers and this living lab is still is still working we have also done some political uh, things we walked to the minister of agriculture with uh, with a, a plan Um, and at the moment, you can still visit that. We have an exposition in Leeuwarden where, um, yeah, we are collecting knowledge uh, uh, to give everyone that's, that's involved inspiration about how can we in our province make more room for natural processes and for um, our biodiverse landscapes. But of course, um, this is the most important thing why we are all here. We also started an ecosystem restoration camp and we actually did that after 2018. We had done uh, all these, these projects and then we thought, okay, um, what are we going to do now? And uh, yeah, we, we asked our community, what do you think is necessary? And one of the things that came out of that was that there was really a need to work together with each other in, in the landscape and really to learn by doing and um, we had organized awakening landscape before so that that was um, a way to really discover the beautiful places of the landscape and then i met uh, john Liu at a conference in the netherlands and he told he told me about ecosystem restoration camps and i thought well that's actually exactly what we need um, uh, what our association uh, needs at the moment so um so we wrote we wrote a plan and um the thing is we don't have our own land so we, so we don't own land but we do have a large community so we do have a lot of people in our community that do have land so we decided to start up a mobile camp uh camp king's garden and um which which this means that uh, we we visit places we visit places that belong to people in our community that uh, uh, want to work on ecosystem restoration and we pick a theme each each time and we organize a camp around it. We only started uh, last year, so we are still a, a new camp, um, but we already uh, had some really nice experiences and I I just want to show you a little bit about the things that that we have done. Uh, so far. Um, so one of the themes that we are working on in uh, King's Garden is Herbridge Meadowlands. Well, I've just told you about the importance of Herbridge Meadowlands and we organized a camp last year um, in, in which we actually started with the history. So how, how, uh, um, how did that develop, this Herbridge Meadowlands? How were people working on the land before the bigger machines uh, came and one of the things they did is that they were working with this um, instrument which is i hope i pronounce it right i think it should be pronounced as a site 
if I'm not saying it right and someone knows, just tell me. Um, but a long time ago, people from Germany would walk all the way to the Netherlands to work on our fields and to work with this instrument on the fields um, for weeks in a row. Um, and But I mean, you can imagine what a different situation that was. I mean, now we have all these machines and we can mow the land just, you know, in, in one day, but this would, this would really take a long time. And also at that time we were not able to control the water as we are doing it right now. So it, it meant that large parts of the lands were completely covered with, with water in, in the winter time and that water would slowly disappear. And actually, when there was so much water, we couldn't work. We couldn't work on the land. So we had to wait until it was dry enough to work on it. And in that time, the birds that were living there, they could actually lay their eggs. Their chicks could grow up because there was no human that's, that's, that's coming there. So this, I mean, I'm not saying we have to go back into the history, but it does tell us about how the way that the landscape was, was functioning and the way we were interacting with it and the large change that we have now. So how can we uh, recreate that situation and recreate the, the wealth of that landscape in our current modern times? That's the question we are asking in, uh, in this, in this uh, camp. And here you see that, well, first we practiced and here we were actually uh, mowing uh, um, the grass in this way, which is, I can tell you, it's, it's quite difficult. Um, and we also learned about the different species that, that, uh, of, of plants that were living there. And what we did in this camp is that we collected hay um, that was still carrying the seeds of the different uh, species that, that are the floral species that are living there. So we collected the hay. As you can see, we used, uh, uh, John Liu already talked about Frisian horses. These are Frisian horses. And we used several methods. We also used modern methods, but we also used the ancient um, methods to, um, to uh, transport the, the hay with the seeds. And then we would um, spread out the hay with the seeds at a location that could use um, yeah, more diversity of, of plants. And uh, the advantage of, of doing that instead of buying seeds is that you really use the, 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 the seeds that are native to that area. And you also use the DNA that belongs to that area. And the insects that are living there, they're completely adapted to those species. So if you want to help biodiversity, it's really important to as much as possible use um, the seeds that belong to to the area and we are trying to do that in this way and also when you um, use the hay you also bring uh, for example fungi uh, you, you bring it along and and we all know that that it's it's about the whole web of life so these fungi also play an important role and another uh, project uh, we are doing at the moment um, so on the one hand, we have the Herbridge Meadowlands, which is an open landscape. Um, but if you look in the same area, if you look at the farms and, and the yards around the farms, actually at those places there, there's room for trees. And um, one of the things that used to be quite common in that area uh, were fruit, fruit courts. So that th those were courts with uh, fruit trees. I'm not sure if this is the right English tr translation, but if you select fruit trees, you can choose between different kinds of fruit trees. And there's a fruit tree that's a high trunk fruit tree, so the trunk becomes quite high. It becomes much older than uh, the more commercial trees that don't become that high. And because of the height, um, there's also different mosses growing growing on it. And because it becomes a lot older than the commercial fruit trees. Um, in the end, the, the tree will become hollow, so different kind of birds can, can live in it. And usually, uh, when people are starting a, a fruit court, they are also protecting it against the wind. So they are um, planting other trees and shrubs around it to protect the fruit trees from the wind. And by doing that, they are actually kind of creating a biotope that you can compare to the, the edge of a forest. 
And in that biotope that you are creating around the farm, um, you are also creating the biodiversity that belongs to it. And one of the birds that loves to live there is the Icterine warbler. It's, it's a beautiful little yellow bird that imitates um, a lot of other birds. Uh, it's also a migratory bird. And um, yeah, with that project, we, we try to uh, recreate those, those, uh, those food courts. And also we, we had an explanation about it, about what's the best way to plant it um, and to take care of it. And then the, the people of the project would do it at their own farm. Um, so this is, uh, yeah, the, the two main projects that we are doing at the moment. And in 2022, we have some new activities planned. Um, this Sunday, we have, uh, yeah, a little excursion. Um, we are uh, going with a guide. We are going into the area and we, uh, we are going to look, look up birds that are, are, are living around the farm or around your house and try to recognize them by, by, their, by their sounds. Um, we also want to organize a concert in, in one of the food courts. So it will be a human singing with the birds that are singing. And um, in the summer, we are going to do another meadow camp. It's mostly going to be a knowledge camp. So learning about the history of grasslands, about the flora and fauna that live there. Um, I say live there because I think we are um, actually living together with, with all these all these plants and and uh, and animals. And in autumn and winter, we are continuing with the fruit tree project. And we are also going to pick up some new projects in the southeast of Friesland, which is a completely different landscape. And I think I would like to end my story with this. If if there's one thing that um, that I've learned in the last years that I'm working on. Uh, this, these projects is that um, before you start with ecosystem restoration, it's really important to be aware of where you are because each landscape has different opportunities. Um, it, it, it has a different soil. It, it, there's there's dif differences in height. Um, and all those things of the surroundings tell you what, what the possibilities and what the opportunities are. And if we if we do that in a different way, if we go somewhere and we pro only project our own ideas on that location and we're not looking at where are we exactly, then I'm not sure if we are making the situation any better. So I think for ecosystem restoration, it's really important to have a sense of place. Where am I? And what would nature give me if, 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 I'm, if I'm giving it the space at, at this moment? And what's, what's the existing cultural landscape that uh, is actually open for a lot of biodiversity, and I mean open figuratively in this way, that will invite a lot of biodiversity. Um, and I think that's that's really important uh, in ecosystem restoration. As you can see here in the middle, you see the godwit, but in other landscapes in Friesland, there you would choose other species to call them the king of of their landscape. Um, yeah, uh, this was my story for so far. So uh, if there are any questions, then uh, I will hear it. Thank you for listening. <laughs> Thank you so much, Marcia. It was a wonderful presentation. And obviously, because I'm uh, Dutch from Drenthe, close to Friesland, it really relates to me. So thank you so much for all this knowledge sharing. <laughs> You're welcome. Yeah. Thank you for listening. <laughs> <laughs> is there any any first question for Mercia? I know that it's it's a little later, but all, all this information that we got so far is so interesting. So yeah, maybe I wasn't in the 20 minutes. I'm sorry. <laughs> no worries at all. Is there any first question for Mercia? <laughs> I think you explained it very well. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> John. I, I, want, I wonder, um, Martin Lancaster's yep. um, Garden of Aden's is, is, is there. Are you able to, to connect with the, the long time? I mean, he, he began the first vegetarian restaurant in Amsterdam. He started the Biodynamic Association. Yeah. So, 
I mean, it's decades and decades of experience. And he's, he's been awarded the, the, a medal, the, the King's medal, my goodness. So, yeah. And uh, that was the real King. I mean, I mean, depending on what you think of the real, but that wasn't the bird King that gave him the medal. That was the human King that gave him the medal. Uh, the medal well, I yeah. Think, <laughs> I think the, the bird King appreciates him too. Definitely. Yeah. So your question, I think, was is, is is I mean, I'm not sure if that was your question, but we we uh, we know Martin very well. As as I said, I met my boyfriend in his Garden of Eden, um, and he's also in the same area uh, of where we are um, mostly working. And actually, the fruit court that I was talking about, he has a really beautiful one. Um, so he's definitely one of the examples of how you can um, create this this biodiversity also around your 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 farm, um, and he has some some land um, wh which is quite herb rich as well. Um, so definitely, there's there's some inspiration to be found at, at his place, and uh, uh, yeah, he's 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 part of our community. <laughs> Thanks very much. Huh. Yeah, I would just like to, well, firstly, to thank Marcia for the amazing presentation. I just, every time I listen to you, I learn more about, about what you're doing in Friesland, and I'm just so inspired. So thank you. I also uh -huh. wanted to say for, um, for those of you who are lucky enough to be in the Netherlands and um, keen to attend this weekend, perhaps you'd like to share your contact details in the chat so that people can can get in touch with you and then yeah. in terms of the other the upcoming camps in in, in august uh we'll yeah. be able to share those details close to time in our socials and and our newsletter yeah. thank you so i just shared my email address and of course you can also found, find us on the ecosystem um, restoration website And yeah, when the dates are 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 set, then then uh, I will contact you, uh, Kat. <laughs> I, I do see a uh, question coming up from uh, Digital and Stone. Digital, mm -hmm. Digital and Stone, are you happy to to ask in person, or shall I read it out loud? Sure, I can ask in person. Um, my name is actually Caroline Jones, but um. My company is Digital and Stone. I'm, uh, thanks very much for the talk. That was super inspiring, especially the way um, you talked about culture and the integration of the human spirit with nature and the environment, um, specifically, obviously, with, with eco-restoration in mind. Um, and uh, I had a question, maybe more for John, but I mean, maybe Marcia knows as well. And it's more to do with the human body and if the human body can create... Um, a, an eco struct an eco and support an ecosystem um, specifically with green burials and I'm just thinking about how we can give back to the land and I wondered if you knew anything about that or whether obviously food and dead bodies don't go together but um, I would imagine that a body breaking down naturally would support an ecosystem in a natural environment and anyway I just wondered if I could ask about that i i find that uh, i mean maybe john can but i just wanted to say that um so it's it's about us as humans decomposing right that's that's yeah. that's what your question is referring to yeah well i i am I'm, I'm actually thinking about that as well because i i think it's important that that when we um are ready to be decomposed let's say it like that 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 we can actually you know get back in, in into nature and uh yeah it's it's one of one of the points where we are cutting the cycle at the moment um but i know it's it's forbidden to to do it uh you know to to bury your relatives in your in your own garden um so yeah there's there's a lot of rules that are not making that possible and, and actually referring to that it's it's not only with us decomposing it's also with our um shit <laughs> i don't know what's the proper word for it but it's also with 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 everything that comes out of is when we are still alive yeah. that's also a really important part of 
of the cycle and actually we are losing um, a lot of important nutrients that that we are now burning um, and these nutrients they 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 we cannot get them back so yeah i think uh, us human bodies needs to need to be part of the cycle again yeah yeah. I agree too, but I also feel that there's a very similar to what you come up against with the eco restoration and the eco restoration camps and everything that John's been working on for all these years is there's a system in place that doesn't support it and you've kind of got to go through that first. And the reason mm -hmm. why it doesn't necessarily support it is because it's the big, you know, the big farmer or the big cemetery or the big farmland or what have you. So there's a lot to take on. But anyway, John, I, I yeah. I, I think one of the things that's happened in, in, in discussions in China, because the awareness that the, for instance, the, the forest lands were relatively, you know, reduced, massively reduced, and, and now they're coming back. They're, the Chinese have been planting trees like crazy for decades now. But uh, one of the things that, that I saw and it, it happened when my father was actually buried. So there, the, the problem is that in many countries in China and elsewhere, the, there's this kind of movement to create a monument to, to, the, to the person who has passed. And um, <clears throat> what we were we began to discuss we had a actually quite large um meeting together with the authorities the government authorities the party authorities and the scientific uh organizations and we we talked about the idea of memorial forests the idea that actually we need to protect forests in perpetuity and one of the big problems with forests is that they they get turned into plantations and they're harvested and everything and so if we if we never actually have any forests that reach climax equilibrium then um you know we're not we're not interrupting the solar radiation at the highest level and creating the the the, the most uh, effective way of holding moisture near the earth and <clears throat> one of the ideas that came up was like well these memorials these these stone things actually they're just ruins you know we're creating ruins for for the future generations to look at and what we really want is to restore the ecological function so that future generations will will enjoy that and th this led to the concept of memorial forests. And if we could, so many of the people who die are quite wealthy. You know, they've spent their lives accumulating material things and wealth. And if they were to endow the forests and maintain these memorial forests so that they were held in perpetuity and all their descendants would honor this because it, they're remembering their ancestors. And, you know, in a, in a country like China where they basically worship, they have ancestor worship, literally. Um, this, is, this is quite possible. So I think if once we start thinking about culture, what does it mean to have a global culture? Is a global culture the, the, the conquistadors who conquered people, is that the history? Or is the history the history of people who are learning that all cultures have over internal time studied what is the meaning of life and there are different understandings. So if 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 we look now, we have a global culture and we have to make sure that that global culture reaches its highest potential rather than holds on to the lowest common denominator. So hopefully 
you can do that. But I think, I think the burial has something to do with this. And we just don't have room for these huge stone cemeteries and, and all this waste from that. And it doesn't really help us in healing. And what, what the, when people walk through a memorial forest and they feel the moisture and hear the bird song and there's, you know, this is absolutely the best way to, to memorialize people. Right. So let's, we, we, I think as this movement grows, this movement has the interesting phenomenon to focus a collective intelligence around the world. And I notice that we're not just in one country, we're all over the world. So if this becomes like normal to discuss this around the world, and the rest of the media, the media seems to be slightly schizophrenic or maybe insane um, and motivated by other purposes like materialism or, or you know, selfishness, then if we can communicate this way in a conscious, compassionate, and egalitarian way, then this this is so appealing to the majority of people compared to the type of insanity that we've been all been watching for the last few years, especially. But it, it's been growing for a long time. But um, but now we have a chance to change that, and we don't we can't do that alone. We can only do that when we're all together. So the more camps we have, the more this is shown to be rational and and make a lot of sense and it's good for the community, it's good for our children, it's good for future generations, it's good for the earth, and it's good for ourselves. This is really what we need to do. So I'm, I'm pretty chuffed that we've gotten to this point. Thank you, John. Um, Shirley, I believe that you have a question for Marcia. Are you willing to ask her in person? Shirley Thompson from Camp Kirigai. Hi, such a wonderful um, presentation. Thank you so much. And it was really inspiring of what's possible. Now, I wondered about the model of using individual species instead of using ecosystems or, or food chains, because I know that's the model that our ecologists use who study and approve that the tar sands is actually good for different birds, right? Um, that well, um, well heads are better than solar panels. Like you can really come up with those kind of findings quite easily using one species and one area. Yeah, well, actually, um, I think it's a really good, good question. And and actually, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm also happy that you're asking it because it means I have to change something in my story. <laughs> because actually what we are doing is we, we are looking at the system as a whole. Um, it's just that we are using individual species to help us tell the story. Um, because these species, they, they need something from the landscape. So they tell us stories about what they need. But of course, these species are, are par part of a whole ecosystem that's completely interdependent. And if, if you only take one example, like the, the godwit that, 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 that's kind of like our icon of, of this association, uh, the godwit lives in the meadowlands, but another bird, the lapwing, which lives in the same meadowland, needs completely different some things need they are similar but there are also things that are completely different in their needs um and it's actually very risky i mean if you are working on on ecosystem restorations recent restoration um it's very risky to focus on only one species because then then you know you will create um situations that are not good for the other species so actually when we are doing the ecosystem restoration we are not focusing on one species, but we are really focusing on the system. Um, and I think we are focusing on the biotope to, to create a biotope that's, that's healthy. And, and when you do that, the species will come. But to bring this, the story to the, to the public, 
and to make it more colorful, the species help. Um, but yeah, I'm 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 very happy that you're asking it because if if you get this out of out of my story, then I and then I have to make some changes in the story actually. <laughs> Thank you. No, I think you you try for both, but it is the model. Of oh, can't hear you anymore. <laughs> focusing on this species, right? And we kind of lose the understanding of everything else. But also, it's it's the model of ecologists, where they look at one species at a time, and you know, are used very well by the oil and gas industry to support their claims. So yeah, it's a big, you. in ecology, it's a big dis discussion. I mean, are we focusing on species protection or are we focusing on biotope protection? It's, it's between ecologists, it's, 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 a, it's, it's, it's a huge discussion. Um, and um, what's, what's difficult is, is I mean, the, the Godwits, um, is quite well known, but if I look at it uh, from a Frisian perspective, there are also certain species that really have really specific demands of their biotope. And if we don't know these specific demands, I mean, we are already working with such tiny areas where we can protect them. We have to know their, de their, their demands, otherwise they will be gone um, really soon. So the most ideal situation is that you don't have to know it. You just you just have to live with the law of nature. You know, don't pollute nature, don't destroy nature, and embrace natural systems, and then the species will come. But we are not living in 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 such a way. So some species need, unfortunately, need that protection. But we want to go to a world where we can focus much more on on the bigger picture. If, if I could add a word or two to this, I, I think that um, we really um, need to understand that there are 8 billion people on the planet now, and we're, we're adding a billion people every 12 years, so we will most likely go to 9 and 10, and, and maybe there's some demographic considerations that will slow and 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 uh, and what we what we see in many parts of the world is that human beings in highly developed areas of the world and in places where women have equal rights and there's access to contraception and family planning then the population rates go flat and they actually decline so um, the future's changing, and it, human beings are now recognizing how much impact humans have had. And what I think we, we can look at, and again, you know, I, I, I sort of noticed this, and I, it's also been part of the thought about why we need to have ecosystem restoration camps, is that we have so many different points of view, so much differences in our cultures and in our education and our opportunity. And so ecosystem restoration camps makes it possible for people to go together and learn together and have different types of people. And I love the fact that the King's, King of the Meadows is bringing poets and musicians and theater and scientists and farmers all together to talk about this because this is the way we can use collaborative inquiry for collective intelligence and if we reach this sort of goal where we sort of all know well okay the hydrological cycle is a real thing and there's moisture near the near the surface of the earth and there's moisture high in the atmosphere and which do we want well, kind of if it's high in the atmosphere, artificially, we're creating a more of a greenhouse effect. And if it's close to the earth, we're cooling the earth. And it's available for us to breathe. If we're in relative humidity, it's completely different than if we're in a hyper arid area and we're being desiccated. And so 
if we have this collective understanding, then it has to be the central intention of human civilization to protect it. And there are, there's infinite nuance in ecology. So once you start studying this, you can forget about graduation because you're never going to know it all. But what you will learn if you continue to study it is you'll have a lot of knowledge and it leads to a lot of inferences and that's a very good thing so the more people who who are following this path and also when you start i've, I've kind of noticed that you cannot unlearn things so if you learn things which are fundamental truths it's it, it's kind of hard to go back to ignorance you know if you say well i you know there's too much evidence this is true and so you can't unknow that so when you know certain things then you must you know you you can like say well i'll just ignore it and go the other way but i don't that's not very easy to do and uh if you have any kind of um predilection to morality or to integrity then you can't you just can't do that so um, I, think, I think we're on the right path and there are nuances and there are differences. And certainly, you know, like I, I've been worrying about cloning a little bit, but actually I think cloning, we may need cloning to, to maintain certain species that will be lost. And if they have unique properties and you know, we need them. So we may need to use advanced science for some reasons, but we, we need to be careful with it. So for instance, I was noticing in the Netherlands that the clones are often the same, I, I mean, identical. They're planting the same individual out. And this is very dangerous because if there's an influence which damages that, that individual, the whole thing will be gone. And if that's a forest with with the thousand, five thousand trees that are all the same individual and it's attacked and it all dies in once, you're gonna lose 30, 40, 50 years of, of, of biomass and you know, don't do that. So understanding these things and the public needs to understand these things. Everybody needs to understand these things. So if we, if we work together to study this and, and then to take that even further, it's really touching on the question of value. Because now we have a massively corrupt and unsustainable materialistic society. Well, that's not going to work. It's not working now and it won't work in the future. So something has to change. And <clears throat> when, when we don't consider these issues, we don't get to the conclusion like, well, we better share. You know, everybody is equal that's where we need to get to. Everybody needs to eat. You can't like go past the street and somebody's lying there and you're like, okay, sorry, buddy, you're going to die in the street. I'm just going off. We can't do that. So we need to look and, and we can't even just wait for them to be lying in the street next to us. We have to realize that there are millions of people who are wandering the earth now as refugees at the edges of huge degraded landscapes. So whatever privileges we have, if we have the privileges, if we have food and we have time and we have education, we have a responsibility to address those. If you're wandering virtually naked at the edge of a, you know, fleeing violence at the edge of a degraded landscape, you know, save yourself, you know, but, but if, you're, if you're in a privileged position with, with knowledge and access to, to, to time and money, you, you have more responsibility to deal with this. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't worry too much about the details because we, we really don't have, it's not, I'm, I'm not saying don't study them. I'm just saying it's gonna be infinitely complex. It's hard. It's gonna take generations of human civilization to undo the mess that we're in, but nature is resilient. Nature is beautiful. It comes back faster than you imagine. 
And that's where the joy and satisfaction is. So if we follow this direction, we can deal with all of the nuances. And it's not a theoretical issue, it's a physical issue. So we have to do it physically. And in physically doing it, we answer the theoretical issues. We learn more. So that's what I think about that. Thank you, John, for sharing your thoughts. Um, I do want to get, but maybe we can um, follow up this discussion after, but I think there is one more last question for, for Mercia specifically. Um, and if there are more, let me know. But I think that Digital and Stone, I, I'm sorry, I forgot your name. <laughs> you mentioned it earlier, but you were asking one more uh, question for, for Mercy, I believe. It's actually three questions in one, I think. But uh, yeah. yes, three <laughs> questions in one. So yeah, my name is Caroline, Caroline Jones. Um, okay, Caroline. Yeah, so the question was um, the migration routes that you were talking about and the habitat corridors, are they protected? Um, and um, is that land conserved or is it conservation and restoration being two separate things? I was kind of asking if, if you know, the migration routes are protected and is it protected because you're restoring the land and that's under some kind of legislation or is it protected because they're under conservation or they're not necessarily protected? Um, uh, it's 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 quite a difficult question actually. I mean, yeah. I I I don't think, but but maybe I'm wrong, but I don't think that the migration routes in itself are protected because, for example, with the the godwits, um, the godwits, it's very often when it leaves the Netherlands, it passes via Portugal and Spain and then goes to Africa, and a while ago they were making plans. Um, in Portugal for a new um, large airport and it was actually at a at a place where there was now a nature reserve and um, a lot of the godwits are resting before before they continue to to Africa and also on the way back and um, as it looks now the plants are going through so so it means that this specific part is is definitely not protected. Um, people from the Netherlands that are um, uh, working to preserve this this species, they they are of course protesting. And another example is um, I I know that sustainable energy is is a large topic, but they are also placing large windmills on migration routes, and we are losing a lot of birds that are actually flying into these windmills and, you know, just die. So and, and that, that answer to your question is actually no, the migration routes are not protected, but of course in each country there are uh, nature conservation laws that are actually obliging us to, to protect our biodiversity and protect our nature, but if you look at the practice, and, and how we can um, actually maintain that law uh, and what belongs under it and what doesn't belong under it. It's, it's, it's quite complicated and I don't think it's, I don't think it's well organized enough. I think, I, I think in general we could say that nature needs a lot more rights and needs mm -hmm. a lot more protection than it's, than it's getting now. Um, so yeah, I mean, on the whole route, uh, in, in Africa, not another example, the, the godwits, they are uh, breeding in the Netherlands. And when um, they don't succeed, so when their offspring dies before it can fly, um, the adult birds, they leave our country earlier. And so they arrive in Africa earlier. And in Africa, they're actually living most of the time on the rice fields of the farmers there. And when they leave uh, uh, in the Netherlands earlier, they are actually arriving in Africa on the rice fields when the farmers have just started to um, sow their, their, their rice. So they're actually eating the um, seeds of the farmers there. And so a lot of the farmers there, they really hate these godwits because the godwits, they are, they are eating their, <laughs> their produce. Um, and, and I think it's, it's a really good example of how everything is connected. And, and um, one researcher said, it was about another, another bird, but also migratory bird. If we 
do all the effort in protecting uh, the habitats of the birds in our country, but we are not doing it along the entire route. We are not doing it together. And, and we don't create, because these farmers in, in, in Africa, um, I mean, they, they have to earn a, a living as well, of course. So, so we understand their frustration as well. And it's, but we have to work all together uh, to really, um, yeah, protect these 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 uh, these migration routes. And yeah, it's not well it's not well enough arranged. <laughs> Definitely not. Ursia, can you clarify where in Africa these birds go to? Well, actually, you can actually there's um, a website where you can follow them. Uh, it's it's also on our website. Uh, they go to uh, different places, but mostly on the west coast uh, and a little bit, yeah, they're kind of spread on the west coast, but they don't go all the way down. I will, one second, I will show, I will uh, share the link where you can follow them. I mean, some of them, they have a, a tracker. One second. And do you, do you have connections in Africa? Um, well, not me personally, but uh, people in, in our community, they are working uh, together with Africa a lot, yeah. So the, the whole research around this bird, uh, it, it, it has a lot of uh, international collaboration. And here is the link where you can follow them. Actually, there are already some uh, godwits in Africa. Uh, yeah, so they would go to Senegal and Mauritania and Mali. Um, Guinea-Bissau is also a place where where they where they go to. But if you um, if you follow this link, you can follow them through the the year. Nice. Is it in the in the chat? It's in the chat. Oh, I really, uh, accidentally signed it to uh, one person. <laughs> one second. Great. There you go. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. All right. Well, considering the time, I don't know if there are any questions um, for Marcia, but I think um, it would be maybe nice to round it up for Marcia. And I mean, if you're you're more than welcome to stay longer for an open discussion, maybe some topic um, really related to you and you want to discuss it further with with either John or Marcia or with other people from the ERC, uh, please, please stay. But if you uh, are occupied, thank you so much for, for joining us. And um, thank you also, Marcia, for your presentation, by the way. Um, yes, thank, thank you, everyone, for, for your time and being there. It's always lovely to connect. Although it's digitally, it still feels like we are connected. Um, so thank you, everyone, for being here. And Marcia, um, particularly, thank you so much for giving this very good explanation of the situation in Friesland and the work that you are doing. And I'm excited about the new camps that are coming up. I have, I have a, one question off the, uh, off the thing. Do you have one of those poles that you can jump over the canal with? Is, is that a question to me? Yes. Well, I don't have the, the, um, them, but I do have friends that can do it really well in all different kind of ages. So, um, I mean, there I know old farmers who can still do it. And uh, yeah, I I want to learn it. Yeah, but I I don't ha I don't I'm 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 actually not a original Frisian. I come from a different part of the Netherlands. So um, I learned to speak the language, but I have to still have to learn that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, John, okay, well, next. Um, John, next time you're here, Marcia, you and I will do one of these. But do prepare right. to get wet. I've done it once; it's horrible. You really have to overcome fears. <laughs> can, can you go yeah. rent the rent the things, or do you there, actually there's have actually to a place it? where you can train? You have a dry spot where you can train. <laughs> yeah, and they actually made. I mean, so this is they used these sticks uh, back in the days as a means of transportation. When what, what I said is. Uh, these meadowlands they used to be um, really wet and and you needed to jump over water to get from one place to the other 
So it used to be really a means of transportation, but now they made it into a sport as well. And it's actually, they go even further. They have a, a much a higher stick and they climb in, in it all the way to the top. And then they try to jump as, as far as possible. And it's, it's, it became a Frisian sport. <laughs> Yeah, it's very difficult. I also tried it once, but I'm I'm I, I'm willing to try it again, especially if John and Peter are joining. <laughs> All right, we will organize it. No worries, and fiddle uh, up an ecosystem restoration camp. Yeah, that that can be a cultural thing. We can we can do a tree planting with a side of jumping over canals. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, or or um, collecting seeds, and uh, yeah. <laughs> I see. So, yeah, yeah, go ahead. No, uh, yeah, I see one more last question from Eva van Stream. Uh, are you using eco toilets on site? Well, when I organize something that needs toilets, I always um, rent eco toilets. So I've never ever rented a chemical toilet in my life. And otherwise, I just use a toilet uh, from the farmer. What what or nature? What are, what are eco toilets? Um, so that that is legal in the Netherlands, and so are they are they yeah. methane digestible? Uh, no, we 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 have different ones, but uh, the one that I use is it's with um, sawdust. So you basically cover it with sawdust, and you and you you compost it um and uh yeah for as far as i know it's it's legal <laughs> i i think in the united states they they kind of still haven't understood this but i think you can get around it by having one chemical toilet which you don't use i mean just tape it shut and then <laughs> use the they call them here luggable loos they use these five gallon bakery buckets and they have a toilet seat that fits right on top of it and you can and then you can use sawdust but actually at the hotlum camp we were using biochar biochar works very well because it has actually no smell it, it, it absorbs what, uh, tremendous amounts of everything somehow I'm That's amazed by, by the sawdust. I, I, I find it very clean as well, actually. And, and actually at one, at the festival that we had in, at the camp in Spain, they, ha they had um, two or three or four um, like uh, straw bales. And so these were for the men, the, the pissoir, the, the urinals were like these, these uh, straw, straw bales and they work very well. And I, I think that would make excellent compost after the festival users have, you know, kind of moistened it up. And we, we, have a, we have a project going on right now and it's actually uh, called the hole in the loop. The human hole in the loop and it's about our human hole and about how what's coming out of it is actually a very important loop in the whole uh, circular agriculture thing <laughs> yeah and the the i mean obviously from a technical perspective what, what they're discussing now in the united states is that we have to all give up our gas ranges because it's all connected to um to fossil fuels but i think if we just get the toilets right we can have methane production easily from human waste as long as you don't put anything into it and uh, kill the bacteria so you have this methogenic bacteria and also you have the possibility of vacuum collection so like if you think about sewage gravity flow sewage and pumping stations to pump sewage vacuum is a way better way you know like you just create a vacuum and then you open the vacuum and then everything is compelled to leave and uh, i think that you know you you could 
design very carefully the piping systems and have vacuum stations instead of pumping stations. And you could move it to a central location where you could make tremendous amounts of methane. And uh, you could probably even have a smaller diameter pipes and they would fit in the existing pipes. So you, you wouldn't have to make all new infrastructure. So from a, yeah, I mean, if we, and I was, I was just thinking like, hmm, if we have an ecosystem restoration camp with a central kitchen and we're, what would we cook with? And if we ha if we set up, and I, I know Camp Coyote is doing this with an Israeli system. It's pretty simplistic because it, it its tank is a giant balloon. <laughs> but um, but if you if you're able to do this, you get enough <laughs> you get enough gas to run your to run your um, gas range. And I must say it's it's quite good to cook on gas you know electricity doesn't really do the same thing as far as i can see but anyway just a thought <laughs> a lot of opportunities for sure i think um people um we can still leave this room open for for discussion um i also saw uh, eva von Stream that she is doing more research about this topic uh so maybe she's excited to to tell more um but also feel free um yeah to leave if you have to go just want to mention that again um but i see a question from uh, nancy lee Wood. okay thank you and thank you so much for the wonderful presentation today. Um, I just wanted to mention, I had put it in the chat, I just learned of a forthcoming book called The Psychology of Totalitarianism by an author from Belgium. And um, I read through the, the description of the book earlier today, and it made me think very much, John, about uh, the presentation that you did earlier with the, the film and how just connected people are from nature and it creates the circumstances the underlying circumstances where people become disconnected from themselves disconnected from others disconnected from nature and you know i'm living in a country i live in the united states i'm living in a country that's going through an enormous amount of violence i mean it is just teeth rattling the kind of violence that's going on and it's it's one more indication of how disconnected my society has become from natural processes and what you were showing john in that film is when people begin to start connecting with nature they begin connecting with each other and with themselves in a much deeper and holistic way so thank you for that earlier today well um thank you and i'm just i put it in to the, but there it is again. That is a link to watch that film if you want to watch it. It's uh, about the Mendocino Jail and the Unconditional Freedom Project, which is um, starting a botanical sanctuary in the prison. And it's interesting because the Unconditional Freedom has another thing called the Art of Soul Making, which is communicating. And I think they're they started in that forty. 40 institutions around the United States, but it's up to, I think, 90 now. So this is a kind of, I mean, there you have this cohort and the number of incarcerated people in the United States is also unbelievable. And it's also heavily skewed toward young black males and uh, Latinos and a huge population of Native Americans. So in Mendocino County, it's very high incidence of Native Americans in prison. So, you know, they, they are seeking and they need, they need to, you know, I, I think it, you know, I'm not a psychologist, but I think the concept of all these pathologies that this, you know that's what you're you're seeing and they go down this path and then the path widens and, and they get into into really a lot of muck there but um 
if we create a flourishing path, that, by the way, is the name of my new, my new podcast. I hope you'll all be coming to visit. We're going to have conversations with lots of interesting people around the world. And we'll also show all the different camps that are going on and, and all the different possibilities. But uh, the flourishing path, if we, if we take people and we, we look and we see that we can um, determine what, what the path looks like, we can go and choose the path <laughs> that we want to take rather than uh, just kind of go, go randomly. So that's kind of, but thanks, Nancy. Great to see you, by the way, Nancy. Thank you, likewise. Any, well, we're, uh, yeah, who's that, Inga? Yeah, with me, there are still so many people in the room, so I guess there's an, uh, enough room for more discussion. Everyone well, is- I'm, I'm gonna say goodbye, so bye-bye. Thanks, Marcia. Thank we'll you, Peter. You. Bye, Hello. thank you. Bye. <laughs> I have to go too, so see you all another time. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye now. Does anyone have something to say? Because we're here. Well, I, I, I wanted to say, th I, I wanted to say that I find it very special that there, there are so many people that are, are, are listening to this, to this chat. And um, honestly, um, I'm, I'm really done with all, everything that's online. <laughs> But uh, I really, I really enjoyed uh, tonight, and and of course for the ecosystem restoration movement, it's 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 a huge opportunity to be able to communicate with each other in this way, um, instead of flying uh, everywhere. Um, so yeah, I'm I'm I, I really I really enjoyed it, and I really enjoyed interacting with with all of you. So that's what I wanted. Thank you, Marcia. I'm glad that you do. I, I see that Jay Johnson is raising his hand, and I see also Jeff. Jeff, you're second. I saw you. <laughs> Jay. Hi. Hi. First, thanks for having this this presentation. I really appreciate all the different uh, hearing all the different things. What I wanted to ask is maybe not really conventional related to this. Do you have? There was some. There was mention of some in the beginning of some, so how do I say it? Some restoration camps in I think Africa. And first I wanted to ask, I had a couple questions. One, how are those connected to Africa? And for me personally, I'm trying to transition from, I work for the Bureau of Land Management and oil and gas permitting and reclamation of those lands working with the operators. And so I'm working to wanting to transition from from that to restoration ecology. And I'm a late career employee, so it's quite challenging how to, to transition to go from a someone that's done something their whole career to transitioning to something new and to be accepted for the different reasons that into a new job it's Quite challenging. So one thing I'm considering is transit uh, applying to the Peace Corps as a volunteer and try to trans transition that way. And I I think a lot of the openings are in Africa, or a lot of the and so that's why I'm asking that question about those restoration camps in Africa. So maybe I could get some experience there. Jay, yes. I put my contact information into the chat. If you write to me, I'll connect you with Chris Gates, who runs the Tanzania, it's, it's called the uh, Permaculture Institute of Tanzania. I can also connect you with Kentucky, which is not Africa, but uh, in Kentucky, there is a, a, a camp forming and has formed and it's got 7,000 acres and it's working on mountaintop, on restoring mountaintop removal of fossil fuels. So if you want to deal with the karma of, 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 of that, uh, that might be wonderful. 
and there's yeah. a tremendous, tremendous guy running this who's who's just great. And they they have uh, it's challenging. the The impact from mountaintop removal means that the forest and the rivers are damaged, and that there's toxicity and that there's disruptions. And then on the other side of that, you have the social situation, which is not good either. So you have the highest incidence of opioid addiction. You have extreme poverty, illiteracy, or you know, limited literacy. And uh, it's, it's, a rough, it's a rough thing, but you have some really great music <laughs> with, with uh, with um, nice uh, bluegrass and stuff, and and those are beautiful areas. If you if you if you know about Appalachia, it's just un unbelievably beautiful nature if it isn't disturbed. But obviously, if it gets the mountains tops removed, it's not. <laughs> there's a lot of work to do. But this all could be. That's what I've been rec recommending is having these camps and setting up central kitchens, creator spaces, and, and cultural stages so that the community comes together to learn what they have to do. And that ultimately this is much more, um, much more valuable. So bluegrass, I'm told, is not native, according to Linda. So... I mean, where did it come from? I think it must be indigenous somewhere. I must be indigenous somewhere. Yeah, I understood Mark. that too. Like poor pretensus, it's a non-native grass species. Maybe that's what they're referring to. Oh, bluegrass. Oh, I was talking about bluegrass music. <laughs> All right, Mark. Thank you, Mark. Hi, John. Um, Hi, Mark. Great to see you. I had a question for uh, Marcia. Um, I was wondering, uh, yeah, to have a mobile ecosystem restoration camp or to organize stuff uh, in the area, is it is your region uh, uh, Friesland or is it uh, a certain part around uh, one of the Frisian cities? Or do I have to well, think well, about this? Well, we have said that uh, we can also travel to other places. Okay. Uh, we are mostly based in, in Friesland because, I mean, our association and, and the largest part of our community is, is in Friesland and then mostly in the middle of Friesland. But this year we are already going to Southeast Friesland. And in our community, we also have... Um, we have a national and international community, so you never know what's what's going to happen. Um, um, but yeah, like I said, the main focus is Friesland. But if you if you want to explore with us to do a camp on another spot in the Netherlands, we can always uh, talk about it. Okay, that's good to know. Yeah, <laughs> we just started uh, two months ago um, a food forest near Arnhem in the side, ah. middle part of the Netherlands. Nice. It's, it's um, the thing with, with the camps is we have to plan in, in, in advance. Um, yeah. I mean, we, we just started last year. We are still learning. But if we plan it well in advance, then, then it would be lovely to do a camp uh, somewhere else. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Good to know. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> Thank you, Mark. Um, before, uh, for, before we go to Andrew, I just want to go back to Jeff Lawhead because he raised his hand <laughs> earlier. So, Jeff? Hi, thank you so much. Um, yeah, I'm in Denver, Colorado, So, uh, but I, it was great to learn a little bit more about what's happening in your part of the world. Um, I uh, have a, a one-acre site here in urban Denver that's a permaculture site, and we're just kind of getting started. So, I mean, it's not a, it's actually, you know, for an urban area, it's a pretty good size because um, it's not, it's not easy to, to get, but, you know, it's not obviously, you know, the, the scale of what you're talking about, but I'm just curious about, you know, um, any suggestions in terms of trying to get started. And, and I find that, um, you know, as much as anything, it's at least in the States, it's, it's a cultural sort of change, you know, I mean, in other words, you think about sort of the, the aesthetics, right? People sort of think about, you know, landscape aesthetics, right? So 
landscape architecture, right? It's all about, you know, green lawns and, you know, yada, yada, yada. So, you know, we've got this like site and, you know, people sort of look at it and they're like, it's weeds, right? Oh my God, it's like, it's crazy, you know? So I'm just, you know, we're sort of trying to struggle, I think as much as anything else is sort of the education piece to it. To be like, no, this is habitat. This isn't, you know, what you guys have uh, is, is not, right? Green lawns that, you know, no pollinators. So I'm just sort of thinking about, you know, these sort of transitional issues of, because I think it's, as, it's, much a, it's an educational piece as much as anything else. And how do you sort of start to, you know, roll that process out? Is, is it a question to me or, or? Well, anybody, I mean, you guys are oh. doing it. So, uh, I mean, whoever wants to take it on, I mean, it's open. I, I mean, I could respond because um, actually my, my partner, um, he uh, started a project many years ago in Rotterdam, in the city of Rotterdam. Um, the, it's called the New Garden. And what they did is they invited natural processes to that spot and combined it also with elements from the landscapes in, in the surrounding. And I don't know what the original landscape is of where you are based. and an urban landscape is also um, a landscape on its own. Uh, but it's, it's very interesting to find inspiration in more natural areas in your surroundings and um, to kind of have like a, a vision board, like what are, what are the things that, that you could create on, 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 that, uh, on that place. And um, it, it's very nice to, to make such a vision board with someone who is an ecologist or who is an ecological gardener in the beginning to have that knowledge. Um, I'm not sure how much knowledge you, you, you ecological knowledge you have yourself, of course. Well, but I, I took a permaculture class, so, you know. Yeah. Enough to be dangerous, but not enough to really know a lot. Well, it, it would help to find someone who knows about the ecological possibilities and the ecological challenges in your in your area, and to make a vision board with with uh, and to find people in your community that are just like you are are interested in regreening their area and um, yeah that want to want to help out. I mean that would already be a start, I think. Sure. Um, yeah. yeah. Thank you, Marcia. Jeff, I hope it, it answered your question, but um, we are also, oh, Kath, I see you raising your hand. No, sorry to interrupt you, Inga, but um, Jeff, I just also wanted to alert you to um, Camp the Birdhouse in Hollywood. They're actually the very first urban ecosystem restoration mm -hmm. camp in the world. And they're they have a wonderful way of engaging the local community in the work they are doing in this very early urban environment. I mean, it's literally under the Hollywood sign in Hollywood. Mm. And they run a lot of local workshops with the community on a whole range of things, um, both from um, bringing biodiversity back to the area to um, song um, uh, workshops and um, lots of different ways that people can get involved. So it really has been an excellent example of how a very small scale ecosystem restoration is possible in an urban environment. Um, so we've got two contacts there. Uh, we've got John Allen and also Cameron, who's the, our main contact there. I'll actually pop his details into, um, you can pop onto their page on the Ecosystem Restoration Camps website. It's The Bird House in California. Um, but I'll also pop Cameron's email address here in the chat so that you can reach out to him. Maybe he's got some, some other perspectives he can share with you. Thank you. Great, very helpful, Kath. Thank you. Um, Andrew, Hase. Yes, hello there. I'm going to stay on audio because my video is a little unstable, but I just wanted to thank thank you for the presentation and thank everybody for um, for all the great questions and just tons of food for thought. Um, my specific question is about the mobile camps. Um, and I'm curious, what, uh, what does that look like? What kind of infrastructure are you bringing around? How many people? Um, it just sounds like such an opportunity to bring the camp to the place that, um, that needs the restoration. Um, so I'm curious if you could just say a little more about the, the practical part of the mobile camps. Yeah, Thank you. of course. Um, well, we started when uh, 
there was COVID. So um, we uh, were actually uh, also really inventing uh, those things ourselves. I, I do have um, experience from organizing Awakening Landscape before and with Awakening Landscape, um, we had um, around 40 tents that we would pitch before everyone would come. We had a compost, compost toilet um, and we would have the dinner at the farm. Um, but what we are thinking about doing, uh, and we, we did it uh, in small scale already um, with Camp King's Garden, is yeah, you create a, a, a place, a mobile kitchen, and, and, and the, the kitchen follows you where you are going. You, you need to have, yeah, you need to have a kitchen, you need to have uh, a toilet, you need to have water to wash yourself. You need to have like a central spot and then you can choose either to to have the tents ready or to or ask the people that are coming to bring their own tent another possibility is that you are sleeping in a stable of a farm or uh maybe another place where where you where you that's close to the area that you are restoring where you can sleep at so there's really a lot of uh yeah, different possibilities to to organize it. And we are lucky that we have such a big network, so we can always ask for the facilities we need at the people we know. Um, we are also cooperating with uh, an organization that has tools. They have a lot of tools for, for, for um, volunteer, volunteers that are working in the landscape. And so each time we are organizing some something, we can borrow their tools. Um, but yeah, as I said, we are also developing it and, and we are um, yeah, discussing whether we should have everything our, ourselves so that we can always be um, yeah, kind of independent or that we are doing it like this when, when we are using the facilities of people we know. So there's, there's a lot of different um, possibilities and of course you need to find spots where the people that own the land are open uh, uh, for ecosystem uh, restoration. And yeah, I think ecosystem restoration also is, I mean, if it's about knowledge sharing, you can go so somewhere once, but if you really want to restore an area, you have to be there more often. So it's really building a long-term relationship with the place that you are um, restoring. Does that answer your question? <laughs> Yeah, thank you. And that last comment that you made is really interesting about building the relationship with the place as well as being kind of mobile and um, moving around. So uh, that's very interesting. Yeah, that's also like bal balancing, uh, of course. Um, there's there's advantages of being mobile and there's also advantages of, of having, a, having a fixed spot. So we are also already thinking ourselves that maybe we should have one smaller spot that's that's really like our headquarters. Um, and then we do, and, and then also we do projects at, at different places. So we are, we are thinking about that. If, if I would add something, Andrew, um, I've noticed that there are quite a lot of sort of older conservation organizations and they, they, uh, they have many accomplishments in the past and so on, but the situation is somewhat overwhelming and the, and the membership gets older and older and it may not be so attractive to young people. And one of the things that you can do is you can go and, and talk to them and very possibly they need younger people and they need act active things and they have a lot to share. And so by joining together, you get kind of the best of all possible worlds because you get people who are very knowledgeable, but you also have the opportunity to introduce some new energy and, and uh, a new perspective. So, so try to work with, with everybody. Yes, I, I completely agree. That's actually, John, that's actually how it works for us because we are working with these organizations that are doing restoration projects for many years and they, 
they say, oh, we are so happy that you are doing this because you're doing it in a different way. And, and yeah, like the people that are helping us, they're becoming older and older and, and, and as you said, very knowledgeable, but we also need to have the younger generation. And I think ecosystem restoration camps movement is also helping us to find these, these younger people to do the projects. And if you combine it with, with culture uh, and music and yeah, things like that, then, then you, you give it um, a different vibe and that attracts different people. So I, 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 in, in our experience, it's exactly as you said, John. I would add one more thing to that. Like the concept of central kitchens and cultural spaces and uh, cultural stages and creator spaces. This may be really necessary at this particular time. So you can see what happened when Russia invaded Ukraine. And you can see how many refugees there were flooding into Europe. So imagine now, now that response was rapid and, and people did things to, to make it better. But if you consider how many people there are all over the world who are refugees and nobody's doing much for them. So, I mean, what's the name? Um, so, sorry, John. I, I think you got muted somehow. Yes, the host you... muted me. Oh, you... it said. But anyway, um, yeah, I, I think I, you know, I, 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 I know I talk too much, so I should just, I should just accept it. I, I give up. Uh, let's be quiet. No, but, John. I, I didn't mute you uh, on purpose. At least I didn't. Uh, John, John, sure? it was me. It was Kath. I'm so sorry. I, I was completely in error. I have That's to come fine. clean and, and own up. Sorry. I, I'm I'm old enough to accept it. <laughs> I get told that all the time. So, um, but anyway, I think that it, it's really a good idea to create the infrastructure necessary, like central kitchens, for instance. This allows us to deal with crises. So like, if we're just playing and we're like going out to restore ecological function and we're having a good time, great. But what happens if there's a disaster? If we have everything in place with tools and food and central kitchens, we're ready. And this is going to save lives and, and keep people productive and functional in, in the crisis moment. That's the critical moment. And if you, if you get to the critical moment and you haven't prepared for it, you're, you're going to be in another, you're going to be reactive instead of proactive. So we could be proactive with this. And so we have our our reason for doing this is long-term ecological restoration. It's the right thing to do, but it's also the right thing to do if things go south and uh, everything is messed up. So get your, <laughs> get your central kitchens and your creator spaces and your cultural stages ready because it's coming and keep smiling. Thanks, John. Um, I think that Marcia needs to leave. Um, myself, I need to leave as well. Um, John, if you want to keep this, the room open, I'm happy to do so, but I think it's also really nicely just to round it up.